Hello and welcome to this video on the misconceptions around what you eat, what you breathe, and what is injected. There is an error in understanding when people argue that injections are more dangerous than breathing in toxic compounds, and this is more dangerous than what you eat. These three avenues are the most common avenues for the entry of toxic and essential compounds like medicine and food. You can also be exposed by direct contact such as makeup and by a metabolism that produces toxic compounds like that made from paracetamol. But the most commonly misrepresented are the three specific examples mentioned. To give an example, the aluminium in a vaccine is injected. A pear has aluminium that is eaten, and there is a small amount in the air from modern sources. The concentrations between each is hugely different, as is its bioavailability and clearing rates. Each source is considered very differently by different groups, and especially anti-vaxxers. For full disclosure, some of the information here has been covered by other sources in greater detail and coherency. Please see the description for a full list of both academic sources and those for further reading. Before getting into the details of exposure levels and mechanisms of exposure, a few things need to be explained. If you would like to jump ahead to the subject matter, there will be a timestamp below. The first thing that needs explanation is bioavailability. This is the proportion of a drug or other substance which enters the circulation when it is injected, consumed or breathed in. And so after this it is able to have an active effect. Bioavailability is the immediate effect of the amount that can be absorbed by the body. It is influenced by the route of administration things like physical barriers, physical properties like hydrophobicity and size, interaction with other compounds, the concentration, diffusion profiles, and more. In general, an injection will follow along a gradient from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Other methods of exposure will do the same but may also be supported by biological mechanisms to favour the movement of compounds that are going against the gradient. 90% of plasma aluminium is associated with transferrin, a carrier molecule, 7-8% with citrate that assists with its solubility, and less than 1% with phosphate, which has both biological functions and solubility features. This bioavailability is also affected by how well the compound can be dissolved in blood. If a substance cannot be dissolved in blood, there is a good chance it cannot cross the cell wall without the help of a specific protein structure. Some of these are called channels or gates. Second is how these compounds are removed. In order to be removed from the body, a foreign compound is either sequestered via the immune system, metabolized in the liver, and then moved to the intestines, or in the case of water-soluble compounds, removed via the kidneys. The kidneys use osmosis to draw water-soluble compounds out of the blood and into the renal ducts that lead to the bladder. Once in the renal ducts, a toxic or unwanted compound does not easily return to circulation. The body's whole blood supply is put through the kidneys roughly every six minutes. This leads to removing approximately 95% of aluminium. The liver removes these unwanted compounds through the hepatic or liver cells, sequestering and then moving the unwanted material into the bile ducts. This can be in a carrier molecule, converted into bile, or other compounds that are removed by organs like the kidneys. Bile removes about 2% of aluminium. The immune system is a little more complicated. It generally catches and encapsulates something called phagocytosis, 
or tries to break down foreign compounds. If it cannot immediately catch the compound, it may flag it for other immune cells. And these can either encapsulate it and take it back to the central immune cells that coordinate the rallying of defense cells, or it can go to the spleen or liver to dispose of the contents. In severe cases of a foreign body, you may get a large number of cells involved, which becomes a hindrance, and this leads to pus. This is a combination of immune system elements, immune cells, and the foreign particulates. The immune system may also choose to release enzymes and antibodies to begin the breakdown of these foreign objects. This is exemplified by the red swelling sensation from the bacterial infection. A vaccine dose is normally somewhere between 0.5 and 1 milliliter. All figures of vaccine concentrations will be in reference to the more common 0.5 milliliter amount. For the sake of heading off the argument that children get too many vaccines early in life, the FDA did study this and found that the maximum an infant would be exposed to over their first year of life is 4.25 milligrams of aluminium. Remember this number as it will be important later. Fourth and finally, there are many sources of compounds used in drugs. These can be found in food, water, and even in the air you breathe. Some are endogenous compounds, meaning the body produces them for functional reasons. They can also be removed via normal biological mechanisms. The difference in their structure is nil, but occasionally they can have performance variation if outside of normal biological values, and this is why the body has strict mechanisms available to initiate control if these values are exceeded or are not met. Let's begin with the example of an intramuscular injection. These are commonly used for vaccines. This is where a needle is used to bypass the skin, subcutaneous tissue, adipose tissue, and into the skeletal muscle. You need to bypass the top layers to get the injected substance called a bolus to an area with both adequate blood supply that can facilitate an immune response and hold the injection in place long enough for this to happen. As has been described previously, vaccines contain something called an adjuvant. This helps in initiating that immunological response. An example of an adjuvant is aluminium. Other examples used are mineral oil and lipids. In vaccines, these are called aluminium salts. The salt aspect makes them more readily soluble in blood and helps to extend the immune response that leads to a better immunogenicity. A vaccine can have between 0.125 mg to 0.82 mg in each injection. The adjuvant is in the vaccine. It is part of the bolus that is injected into the muscle. This creates a small pocket of vaccine, and as anyone who has had a vaccine knows, causes some limited pain in the form of a dull throbbing and swelling. The body responds to this pressure through the arteries and lymphatic system becoming more porous. This allows the injection to move into the bloodstream. This in turn lets antigens into the area of the injection. This begins the immunological cascade, and you would recognize this with a slight redness and swelling occurring around the injection site. These are all normal physiological responses to a vaccine that there is some belief that the bioavailability from this dose is substantially worse than other avenues of exposure. The rate at which the adjuvant and other components of the vaccine diffuse into the artery is important. This figure will reach a maximum concentration in serum between 1.5 and, and 6 hours after an IV infusion. An IV infusion removes the need for diffusion from the initial injection site to a significant extent. It will continue to be detected 
between four and nine days later. That is, an infusion via IV after an initial dose will continue to be detected for four to nine days, after which there is no detectable presence. About 1% of the aluminium in a vaccine is not dealt with as a foreign particle in this time and will need to be metabolized or similar by the body's tissues. That is about 1% of 0.125 milligrams or 0.0125 milligram from a vaccine. Let's now consider the effect of consuming foods with similar compounds. Aluminium is a simple example. Using a liquid to liquid comparison, pear juice has 259 milligrams per litre. One cup or a standard serving would have approximately 62 milligrams of aluminium. This passes from the mouth down the esophagus and into the stomach. Here, acids dissolve everything organic. The aluminium is surprisingly resistant to this process as it has a strong electrochemical bond between the atomic particles. It then passes onto the duodenum where the liver and pancreas add bile and other digestive enzymes. After this, whatever you have eaten, such as pear juice, moves onto the small intestine, where most of the nutrients, and in this instance, aluminium absorption takes place. As with an injection, this is done via a chemical gradient, transport proteins, channels, and other biological processes. It moves across the GI tract into the bloodstream. From here, the majority of blood flow is directed to the liver. As should be obvious from the way people can become intoxicated by alcohol and that painkillers can function, not all blood flow is directed to the liver. Even what is redirected is not necessarily metabolized. The important factor here is how much of it actually gets through the GI tract wall. The reality is that a measly 0.3 to 1% of the total concentration of aluminium gets into the bloodstream from the small intestine. That has an approximate highest value of 0.62 milligrams. The kidneys are primarily responsible for the removal. This still leaves a massive margin in between the concentration of aluminium in vaccine doses and the amount in food consumed. So far, the vaccine has 0.82 milligrams in a single injection, and the glass of pear juice has approximately 62 milligrams that may be consumed daily, if not multiple times a day, a factor of over 75 at a minimum, and possibly far higher. That figure for one glass of pear juice, even allowing for bioavailability, is still about 18 times that of the annual exposure to aluminium from vaccines for a one-year-old. Compare this with toxic compounds you might breathe in. Everyone is exposed to small amounts of aluminium constantly from the food eaten, water you drink and air you breathe. Unfortunately, the concentrations in the air and nature of exposure lead to a greater entrapment of more aluminium than other avenues of exposure might lead you to think. The environment has an average of between 0.6 and 7 micrograms per cubic meter for the public and 1 to 6 micrograms per cubic meter for those occupations that are known to be exposed. This leads to a daily dose of 0.6 micrograms for average people and 21 micrograms for those in the associated occupation. The associated occupations are therefore the highest risk group. In an occupational setting where you could be exposed to aluminium, about 2% would be bioavailable, meaning it will move from the air you breathe through the alveoli and into your blood. At a 2% bioavailability, this leads to the highest risk group having a daily absorption of 0.42 micrograms a day. Over the course of a year, 
that is about 109 micrograms. The half-life for aluminium absorbed this way is not significantly different from that of any other exposure vector. And this means that vaccines have 0.00125 milligrams in a bioavailable form. Food in the form of pear juice has 0.62 milligrams bioavailable and the amount you breathe in is 109 micrograms a year. To put this in context and common units, the amount of aluminium from a vaccine is 1.25 micrograms. At 16 vaccines over a year, that is approximately 20 micrograms of bioavailable aluminium, assuming all vaccines have aluminium as an adjuvant. A person drinking just one glass of pear juice a week will consume 322.5 micrograms of bioavailable aluminium. A person working in a high-risk occupation will be exposed to 109 micrograms a year. When comparing injected aluminium, the vast majority, three quarters, is gone in two weeks, and over three years, the entire remaining amount is gone. The air you breathe in a high-risk occupation is a little more risque. Food derived from aluminium could be regularly topped up with consumption of something as innocuous as pear juice, water, or foods with a high aluminium concentration. The risk is relative, and for the amount of aluminium in a vaccine, as an adjuvant and is bioavailable, there is almost no risk when compared to more significant sources and factors. Overall, the body is very good at removing unwanted and unneeded compounds, and especially those that are either normally useful or toxic. The body balances these with incredible efficiency. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting or useful, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions below.